all it does is model what you're arguing. Uh, so it can tell you why you're reaching the conclusion you're reaching and whether you're reaching a valid conclusion or not. That's all it can tell you. And if you have ignorance, you know, if, if you're ignorant of everything, that goes into the equation and what you get out of it is the same ignorance that went in. So like it doesn't generate uh, magical knowledge. But all it does is uh, help you trim away invalid reasoning and help you realize what it is that you need to actually get to a reliable conclusion about something. Why do we need a, a formula for that? Doesn't it, isn't it some parts, a lot of it common sense? I mean, like what, why, well, why is I think common is? sense is often counter, see the truth is often counterintuitive. Common sense is often wrong. So like, uh, to give you an example, common sense says, okay, I have this theory. I need to go find evidence that proves the theory. Well, we know for a variety of reasons, but including Bayesian reasoning, that that is the worst thing to do. Because you can always, if you go selecting, looking for evidence for your theory, you're always going to find some. So, so you can prove any false theory doing that, right? I see. I can so, see how dangerous that is. Right. You see, yeah. So, so common sense tells you to do it that way. Now, and this is the fundamental realization that, that science is governed by is the opposite of that. And you say like, no, actually, what you need to do is try and prove your belief false, right? And fail. That's the only way that you can be sure that you have reliable results. So you have to do everything within your power to like legitimately try to prove yourself false. Not not sham proofs. Like don't don't try to like come up with a straw man to sort of avoid having to prove, disprove your theory. No, ask yourself seriously, how would I seriously disprove this? Like what do I need to look for? What evidence do I need to look for that would disprove this in, in every possible way? And if you can't think of anything like, well, then how do you know your theory is even true, right? So you really gotta look for that. Bayes' theorem explains mathematically and logically why that is, why it is looking for disproof of your theory and not finding it that actually makes your theory more probably true. That's how planning a sense of God is going to work. He's going to say, there's a, there's a huge body of the things that we believe that we just um, have basically immediately non-inferentially. We just acquire these beliefs in the course of our encounters with things in the world over the course of the day. And some of those we abandon or reject because we get new information. Others we get new information, we consider it, we re reflect on it, and then we settle back on the belief that we originally had. And Planigan wants to say that a God belief is like that. He's got a sensus divinitatis, and he has an immediate apprehension of God's presence in the world. God's existence is obvious to him through this uh, sensory awareness. And it's not something he sees with his eyes or has a normal, you know, five sense modality access to, but he's aware of God's presence. So call it a sixth sense or something. And that informs him about God's presence in the world. So this uh, God view is a part and parcel of this whole pretty radical new shift in epistemology that says there's all these beliefs we have that are not evidential and not argued for. They're not part of evidence. You know, evidentialism is a mistake in order to try to defend those. Um, how are we going to deal with error correction? And, and more specifically, suppose someone proposes that they have a census atheistus that informs them that there is no God or there are no gods whatsoever in the universe. So in effect, Planica has argued that he has a powerful, immediate feeling that God is real. And he doesn't find any of the non-God explanations of that feeling to be compelling. Therefore, God must be real. Okay, now, you wouldn't accept this in any other place. Consider some other examples. Suppose a jury member on a jury you're on says, I have a powerful, immediate feeling that the defendant is guilty of rape. I don't find any of the arguments for his innocence to be compelling. Therefore, he must be guilty. You know, look, you wouldn't buy that kind of powerful, immediate feeling by itself to be sufficient or adequate in any other important matter. You'd ask yourself, well, could this just be a weird artifact of my neurology? I wonder what natural explanation there could be for this strange, disassociated feeling I'm having. Maybe I ate something bad. But Planica says, doubts that it's God are the result of your innately evil nature and the taint that sin has placed on your ability to think straight. And this strikes me as just patently fallacious and a dirty uh, uh, trick that changes the subject here. Now, the last argument Dr. Craig gives, he actually admits, is not an argument at all. This is the argument, so-called argument, from experience. I'll just give an analogy for that. Suppose that you saw a donkey appearing on stage right here, okay? Well, that would be rather strange, but you might say, okay, well, maybe there's a donkey. But now suppose that the person next to you said, oh no, it isn't a donkey, it's a pig. 
And suppose there are lots of other people in the corner who said, no, it's a horse. And so there's, suppose there's a whole lot of people over here who said they saw nothing at all. Now in that case, I think you will be pretty sensible to doubt your experience. You will be pretty sensible to think, well actually, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm not really seeing a donkey. But now this is the position with so-called religious experience. With religious experience, you have a large number of groups of people, all of whom claim to have experience, and all of whom claim to have experience of different truths. Surely the right thing to say then is, maybe it's not a donkey, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I should see an optician. This is not what Dr. Craig is saying. Dr. Craig is saying, it's definitely a donkey. Because I'm not sure about exactly what, even what he means by begin to exist in this context. But let me give you a causal principle which I accept, which I think that he would probably accept too, which is that all non-initial items have causes. Right? Everything that's part of our reality has some antecedent causes, so long as it's non-initial. Obviously, if you, if you just think about global causal reality, initial and you think they're initial items, they've got to have a different status. They can't have causes. That just falls out of what it means to be the sum total of causal reality. You can't have a cause. So it seems to me that the, a, a really plausible causal principle is that all non-initial items have causes, um, which captures both the idea that stuff doesn't just happen with no causes, but also captures the point which seems to me undeniable about the fact that global causal reality can't have a cause. Some physicists, it's true, many I expect, think that time itself began about 15 billion years ago. Does that mean that there was some time before the universe began, when the cause of the universe, this person, was hanging around waiting to bring it about? No, it doesn't. All that it means is that at every time the universe existed, and there was no time before the universe existed. There was no time in which God could have acted. But let's suppose he's right about that. He's not, but let's suppose that he is. Does this mean that this being or this cause of the universe was a person? No, of course it doesn't. Dr. Craig gives two arguments for thinking it was a person. The first one is that it can't be physical and the only non-physical things he knows of are abstract objects in human minds. It can't be an abstract object, therefore it was a human mind. Now this is based on a philosophical view that was popular in the 17th century known as Cartesian dualism, which is the view that human minds are not physical objects and are not dependent in some sense on physical processes. And even if it was a person, why should we think that this very same being that created the universe then hung around doing nothing for 15 billion years and then suddenly starts parceling out real estate and impregnating virgins. There's a universe of causes going back. What's going to be the most economical explanation here? Well, if we go for necessity, it'll be more economical to make, to think the necessary thing is the first thing in the universe rather than to have some extra thing outside. If it's an extra thing outside, we've got more types of things and we've got an extra thing neither of which economy favours. Now there, there's more to what makes for a good theory than economy, but in this case the only thing so far that we've talked about is explaining why there's this set of causes and so it will be better to stop with the initial thing in the universe rather than to go outside. If you're thinking about this yeah. from the point of view of comparing two theories, Right, they've both got a theory of the, they've both got an explanation of the initial thing, namely it's necessary, but the theistic theory's got an extra thing that as from the point of view of anything that we've talked about so far, isn't doing any explanatory work, right? So there's a reason to favor the naturalist theory. Of course, when we start thinking about other things that you might explain with God, versus how you're going to explain them on the naturalistic picture, it might turn out that the theistic story is better. The claim here is just that 
insofar as you're looking at this historical chain of causes and you're thinking about so what explains why there is a historical chain of causes you won't get any advantage by appealing to God as opposed to just appealing to the you now appealing to the necessity of God as opposed to appealing to the necessity of the initial state of the universe or the thing that exists there the initial singularity whatever it is if you take for example the fine-tuning argument they'll just focus on that one thing it's like oh look at how improbable this arrangement of uh of constants physical fundamental physical constants has to be to get stars and planets and therefore life and so on it's like that just has to require design uh intelligent design let's say now okay so let's say that's your theory um how do you disprove it let's say it's that serious let's say that's your theory and, and it is false how would you disprove it and so you get well okay um well, what else would cause that? A sort of random chance would cause that. That's one thing. And so, well, how would I prove that it was random chance and not God, right? So you're like, how do you go, how do you disprove your theory? And if you go looking around, eventually you're going to find some things. Like if you actually start putting evidence in that you've been leaving out. So for example, what would a, a if it was a chance accident, what would we expect? We would expect that the universe would really be extremely inhospitable to life. It would just be like just tiniest little bits to sort of randomly accidentally support life, but most of it wouldn't. Uh, and that's what we observe. So you go out and you see like this, uh, the universe is massive, you know, billions of light years in size, uh, billions of years old, and 99.99999% of it is a lethal radiation filled vacuum. Uh, life can't survive in that. Uh, if you look at all the matter, the actual stuff in the universe, 99.9999% of it is stars and black holes and dust clouds and stuff. They're all lethal to life. You can't live in a sun or a black hole or any of this stuff. So you're looking at like there's there's almost and then if you look at the the tiny 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 amount of matter in the universe that can actually have life on it, almost all of it doesn't. It's still inhospitable to life. Uh, and so um, that's what you would expect if it was random chance and not intelligent design. Dr. Craig tells us that we need God if there are to be moral objective moral values. Now there's two things I want to say about that very briefly. The first thing is that if there are any objective moral values, I know that murdering innocent people is wrong. I know that laying siege to a town and slaughtering all its inhabitants is wrong. That's why I think Srebrenica was wrong. If moral objective values come from the God that Dr. Craig believes in, then that's right. Just look in the book of Joshua. What does he say? Kill everybody except the whore who lives in that town and protected by messengers. So it looks like, if we do think moral obje objective moral values come from God, it looks like we should say Srebrenica was all right. In any case, what reason is there for thinking there are objective moral values? There must be a good argument for this. After all, there are no objective aesthetic values, quite plausibly, so Dr. Craig must give us an argument for saying there are objective moral ones. What is the argument? Well, it was striking, so I wrote it down. He said, there are objective moral values because deep down we know there are. That's it. That's the argument. Now, that may pass for an argument in Talbot Theological College. It may indeed pass for an argument in the White House. But, <laughs> but this, is, this is Cambridge, and it doesn't pass for an argument here. Uh, the philosopher David Chalmers uh, uh, dubbed something the higher problem, capital H, capital P, and it's just the problem that Keith outlined, that is, what is there in addition to the adroitness of the ant, uh, which for, for David doesn't settle anything, uh, is it conscious? Hmm. And uh, how do we tell the difference between a zombie, which is just as animated as Keith there, but uh, for all we know isn't conscious? Um, and I think this is a, a subtle trick, a sort of like a magician's trick, which gets our imaginations off on the wrong foot. Uh, I don't think there is a hard problem. It's just uh, Chalmers' uh, baptism of this hard problem, which has got people convinced there's a hard problem. Um, uh, when he first introduced it, I said, this is just vitalism reborn. Um, after all, there's the hard problem of whether something's alive. How do we know the ant's alive? 
You say, well, look at it. Well, that doesn't prove it. It might just be a robot. <laughs> I mean, maybe it's a zombie ant, or maybe it's not even alive. Now, physicists, biologists, they don't argue about this. The line between living and not living is not an interesting theoretical line. We've learned, well, are proteins alive? Are motor proteins alive? Or are they just little robots? Um, uh, uh, cells are alive. Yeah. How about viruses? Don't ask. We understand that the complexity gradually creates things which are manifestly alive. Amoebas are alive. And you, you, we don't have to create a strict cutoff at and, which and point it's, life... And there's no élan vital. There's no extra substance that you have to put in there that distinguishes the living from the unliving. As many people thought, those were the vitalists. And I think that Chalmers and uh, and Keith here on his on his own expression, they're they're remaking the vitalist mistake, and now they simply moved up a notch and they say, there's an extra soupçon of something, which is consciousness, which has nothing. And 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 Chalmers is very clear about this. Has nothing to do with all the things that I study mm. about consciousness. Has nothing to do with the ability to answer questions or to have your memory adjusted or to change your beliefs or become, you know, get converted <laughs> religiously. Mm. All of those things. Those are the easy problems of consciousness. The only problem that's left over is whether you're conscious. The Gospels are our sources for knowing about the resurrection of Jesus. Are they the kind of sources that historians would want when trying to establish what probably happened in the past? I think the answer to that question is no. When were the Gospels written? Well, they are not contemporary to the events they narrate. Where did these authors get their stories from? Well, if they were not disciples of Jesus, they must have heard the stories from somebody who heard the stories from somebody who heard the stories from somebody who heard them from somebody. Stories about Jesus, including his resurrection, had been in circulation year after year after year from the time that his disciples knew that he got killed and believed he got raised from the dead. They told stories to convert people. They improved the story sometimes. They changed the story sometimes. The stories got modified in the process of transmission over the course of decades before anybody wrote the stories down. And these are not reliable historical accounts. There are too many discrepancies. The accounts are based on oral traditions that have been in circulation for decades. Year after year, Christians tried to convert others by telling them stories to convince them that Jesus was raised from the dead, and they changed their stories while trying to convince people. These authors were not eyewitnesses. They're Greek-speaking Christians living many years after the fact. They're telling stories that Christians have been telling all these years. There was nobody there taking notes. Some of the stories were invented. Many were changed. For this reason, these accounts are not as useful as historians would like as historical sources. What I've given you so far is really just kind of child's play compared to the real problem of why historians cannot prove the resurrection. Next we have the resurrection, oh yes. Now this is a really extraordinary claim. We're told that we have huge amounts of evidence for saying that Jesus was raised from the dead and taken up into heaven. I just want to make two points about this. The first one is that if you have such an extraordinary claim as that, you're going to want pretty strong evidence. Hearsay is not going to be enough. Eyewitness testimony from about 1,500 people might just about do it. But then 1,500 people saw David Copperfield make the Statue of Liberty vanish. Nobody thinks it really did. Second point, of course, is that the source of evidence is pretty suspect. Let me give you one example from the Gospels. Matthew chapter 27, when Jesus died, there was an earthquake. Matthew chapter 28, when Jesus died, the undead started walking the streets. Now, Mark is the earliest Gospel. None of this is in Mark. If our sources start contradicting themselves in this way, you might just start to wonder whether anything they say is true. 
Many atheists argue the world contains too much suffering for it to be the creation of a good God. There are wars, diseases, and natural disasters. Horrific human and animal suffering is built into the very fabric of the world we're forced to inhabit. Isn't this good evidence that even if there is a creator, he is not all powerful and all good? Of course, the faithful try to explain the suffering. Some talk about free will. They say God could have made us puppet beings that always behaved well. But if we're God's puppets, we're not responsible for what we do. God cut our strings so that we can freely choose to do good. But then some of us choose to do evil and cause suffering. That's the price God pays for our free will. So have we shown it's reasonable to believe in God after all? I don't think so. Suppose that, after a bump on the head, I come to believe the universe was created not by a good God, but by an evil God. I believe there's a single, all-powerful creator whose malice knows no bounds and whose wickedness is beyond our comprehension. Who believes in a God like that? Almost no one. Why not? Because the world would look much more like a torture chamber if it were created by such a powerful and wicked being. There's too much love and laughter and too many people being kind and helping each other for this to be the creation of an evil god. Yet notice I can explain why my evil god allows good in the same way religious folk explain why their good god allows evil. I can say my evil god could have made us puppet beings that always did bad things but if we're his puppets, we're not responsible for what we do. That's why evil God cut our strings and set us free, to allow us to freely choose to do evil. Unfortunately for evil God, some of us then choose to do good deeds. That's the price evil God pays to allow moral evil. Have I shown that belief in an evil God isn't absurd? No, of course not. Sure, I can cook up such ingenious explanations to defend both belief in a good God and belief in an evil God. But still, we can be pretty sure there's no evil God, can't we? Mm -hmm. So why can't we be pretty sure there's no good God either? Comes from Blaise Pascal who addresses his pensée to the one who is so made as that they cannot believe, that's me. And he says, well, let me put it to you like this. What have you got to lose? If you bet God exists and loves you and you're wrong, you're no worse off than you were already. If you bet uh, and, and uh, sorry, and you're right, there is no such thing. Uh, there's, you're no worse off than you were already. If you're wrong and there is, you win, as long as you have said you uh, agree with him. So why don't you do it now while there's still time? I have two comments on this. One, religious hucksterism of the cheapest, vulgarest, nastiest kind it's possible to imagine. He says, what do you got to lose? I've got a good offer for you. Come into my used car lot. Come on, baby, just lie a little, and you never know. No, don't talk to me like that, and don't call it piety when you do, or, or be prepared to have piety despised. Second, Bertrand Russell, when asked this question, said, that if confronted with his maker, he would say, I used to be able to do his accent, oh, Lord, you did not give us enough evidence. <laughs> um, I would go a little further. I would say, well, look, boss, if it's true what they say about you, that you're an infinitely kind, forgiving, all fatherly person, this is certainly what your fans keep saying, do you not have a little uh, room in your obviously very capacious uh, heart for someone who just couldn't bring himself to believe in you and really, honestly, truly couldn't? Um, as opposed to someone who won't spend half their life on their knees making fawning professions of faith because Pascal told them it was a good bet. Which of us is the more moral? Which of us is the more honest? Which of us is the more courageous? Which of us has the bluest eyes and is the most sexually attractive? <laughs> now, you're all aware, of course, that the Quran exists and claims to be the perfect word of the creator of the universe. You're aware that once having heard of this possibility and rejecting it, you're all going to hell for eternity. I mean, needless to say, Dr. Craig and I are both going to hell if this vision of life is true. The problem is that everything Dr. Craig has said tonight, with a few modifications, 
could be said in defense of Islam, in fact, has been said in defense of Islam. Okay, the logic is exactly the same. We have a book that claims to be the word of the creator of the universe. It tells us about the nature of moral reality and how to live within it. But what if, what if Muslims are right? And what if Islam is true? Okay, how should we view God in moral terms? How would we view God in moral terms? Or I should say Allah. Okay, we, we have been born in the wrong place to the wrong parents, given the wrong culture, given the wrong theology. Okay, do, needless to say, Dr. Craig is doomed. He's been thoroughly confused by Christianity. I mean, just appreciate what a bad position he's now in to appreciate the true word of God. I've been thoroughly misled by science. Okay, where is Allah's compassion? Okay. And yet, in it, it, he's, omni he's omnipotent. He could change this in an instant. He could give us a sign that would convince everyone in this room. And yet, he's not going to do it. And hell awaits. And hell awaits our children because we can't help but mislead our children. Okay, now, just hold this vision in mind. And, and first, appreciate how little sleep you have lost over this possibility. Okay? Just feel in yourself at this moment how carefree you are and will continue to be in the face of this possibility. What are the chances that we're all going to go to hell for, for eternity because we haven't recognized the Quran to be the perfect word of the creator of the universe? Please know that this is exactly how Christianity appears to someone who's not been indoctrinated by it. 